You should know that S. bovis infections are very uncommon, but for some unknown reason it is associated with cancers of the GI tract. Therefore, if you ever see a patient who presents with S. bovis infection, you should suspect that he she has a GI malignancy and perform the necessary workup. Now we will switch gears a bit and talk about our gram-positive rots. Corynebacterium diphtheria is easy because it only causes one disease, diphtheria. Diphtheria used to be quite common, an upper respiratory infection characterized by fever, sore throat, lymphadenopathy, and an adherent gray-white pseudomembranous film covering the pharynx, tonsils, and or nasal cavity. The fact that diphtheria produces an exotoxin that inhibits protein synthesis via ADP ribosylation of elongation factor 2 is commonly tested on step 1, and this mnemonic can help you remember that. Thanks to vaccination, the DTaP vaccine, which converts immunity to diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, diphtheria has largely been eradicated from industrialized populations. Therefore, if it does appear on step one, you probably will be dealing with a patient who has missed some immunizations or is from a part of the world in which immunizations are less common. We talked about spores earlier in the chapter. Remember that bacillus and clostridium species can form spores when they are nutrient depleted. Spores can only be killed by autoclaving above a specific temperature, 121 degrees Celsius, for 15 minutes, which is done for surgical equipment. Instant hand sanitizers are not effective against spores, and therefore hand washing is encouraged to wash away spores that may have been acquired from patients in the hospital with infections such as bacillus or clostridium. This will help to prevent the transfer of the spores to other patients in the hospital who are immunocompromised. We'll discuss this more next. Clostridium is a spore-forming anaerobe with many subspecies. C. tetani produces spastic paralysis by blocking the release of inhibitory neurotransmitters glycine and GABA and causing prolonged muscle contraction. C. tetani can also lead to the condition known as rhesus sardonicus, characterized by abnormal spasm of facial muscles and resulting in a strange grinning appearance of the face, which is seen in this image. Tetanus is associated with deep wounds or skin punctures, with rusty nails that harbor the bacterium acting commonly as the culprit. Today, however, tetanus is rarely a problem due to vaccination with a DTaP vaccine. C. botulinum can also cause paralysis, but a flaccid paralysis due to inhibition of acetylcholine release from the presynaptic terminals of the neuromuscular junction. The paralytic effect has found widespread medical use in the form of botulinum toxin, or Botox, for purposes ranging from diminishing the appearance of wrinkles to alleviating chronic migraine pain, or even excessive sweating. The spores of C. botulinum have been found in bottles of honey, therefore babies who are susceptible to the spores should not be fed honey in order to prevent a neonatal botulism known as floppy baby syndrome. C. perfringens infections should be suspected in wounds that are gangrenous and foul-smelling. These infections are common in wounded war veterans. Finally, C. difficile infections causing pseudomembranous colitis are important for you to know. An image of pseudomembranous colitis is shown here. C. difficile is a bacterium that naturally resides in the gut and doesn't cause harm because it is restricted from overgrowth by normal gut flora. However, the use of antibiotics such as ampicillin and clindamycin can wipe out the normal gut flora, resulting in overpopulation by C. difficile and profuse watery diarrhea. C. difficile infections are particularly problematic in hospitals, where the spores can be transmitted by healthcare professionals from one patient's room to another. Therefore, it is very important to wear contact precautions and wash hands with soap and water after visiting C. difficile positive patients to prevent transmission of their spores. Bacillus anthracis is a gram-positive rod that produces spores and anthrax toxin. You may recall the anthrax attacks of 2001, during which envelopes containing anthrax spores were sent to several media offices. In recent years, anthrax has received much media attention due to its potential use as a bioweapon. Bacillus anthracis can only be transmitted via spores and presents differently depending on the route of contact. Ingested anthrax causes gastrointestinal anthrax, which is highly lethal but rare. 
Skin contact with anthrax spores causes cutaneous anthrax, which presents as a painless ulceration at the site of contact that goes on to become a necrotic black eschar. Here is a patient with a black eschar of cutaneous anthrax. Systemic disease such as bacteremia leading to death can result. Inhaled anthrax causes pulmonary anthrax, which can cause nonspecific flu-like symptoms such as fever, headache, cough, malaise, and chest pain. Untreated, symptoms can progress to massively enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes, mediastinitis, pulmonary hemorrhage, meningeal symptoms and death, 50% of cases. Remember that with diseases that have multiple symptoms like these, it is good to try to commit the more rare symptoms to memory. In the case of flu-like illness that also has a chest x-ray with mediastinal widening, you should definitely steer toward anthrax as very few other infectious processes would have the latter feature. Wool sorters disease is also pulmonary anthrax, just the term used for those patients who inhaled spores specifically from contaminated wool products. Listeria monocytogenes is a facultative intracellular gram-positive rod. It is an uncommon human pathogen, primarily affecting neonates or the elderly and immunocompromised. It can produce flagella at room temperature, which is responsible for its characteristic tumbling motility. At 37 degrees, however, the flagella no longer develop and the listeria then relies on the host cytoskeleton structure to create an actin tail for itself. These actin rockets allow the bacterium to move from cell to cell. Listeria is commonly found in contaminated refrigerated products such as milk, cheese, and deli meats. It can cause serious infections in neonates which take on two forms. Granulomatosis infantiseptica is an early onset form of neonatal listeriosis due to transplacental transmission of listeria. It results in miscarriages or births complicated by sepsis, disseminated granulomas, thus the name, or multi-organ failure. Late-onset neonatal listeria is caused by transmission of listeria during the birthing process and usually presents as meningitis or meningoencephalitis a few weeks later. Listeria affecting the elderly or immunocompromised typically presents as meningitis, bacteriemia, or sepsis. Both of these gram-positive organisms are unique in that they have a branching filament structure, which can be seen in this picture of a patient who was found to have nocardia on biopsy. When it comes to learning actinomyces and nocardia, keep the SNAP mnemonic in mind for learning how the two bacteria should be treated. Tuberculosis, TB, is a deadly infectious disease caused by Macobacterium tuberculosis. Currently, one-third of the world's population carries some form of the tuberculosis infection. The disease burden is high in developing, impoverished countries such as Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, and Africa, where compliance to drug therapy is a problem. Developed nations such as the U.S. experience low disease burden due to strict case reporting and adherence to efficacious drug regimens. Primary TB begins in the lungs when infectious particles are inhaled and phagocytosed by alveolar macrophages. A chronic inflammatory process ensues, damaging lung parenchyma and forming caseous granulomas made of numerous infected macrophages and necrotic cellular debris. The granulomas are termed caseous because the granuloma has a texture of white cheese when viewed by the naked eye. On chest x-ray, it may be possible to see the primary site of infection in the lung, called the GONE focus. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. Most of the time, infection is controlled in host with intact cell-mediated Th1 immunity, and the host experiences no symptoms from the lung infection. However, TB bacteria are not always eliminated from the host. Rather, they can remain in a viable but dormant form within granulomas ready to be reactivated at the first sign of immunodeficiency in the host. Reactivation of dormant TB can lead to secondary TB when the host immune system is momentarily compromised and allows for escape of the organism from granulomas. Secondary TB commonly favors the apices of the lungs, as M. tuberculosis has a predilection for the high oxygen concentration found there. Symptoms of secondary TB can include fever, night sweats, weight loss, and hemoptysis. Reactivation of TB can also affect organs other than the lungs, such as the kidneys, 
gastrointestinal tract, lymphoreticular system, the CNS, or vertebra. TB affecting the CNS is known as parenchymal tuberculoma, or meningitis, while TB affecting the vertebra is known as Pott's disease and can lead to compression fractures. Rare complications of primary TB can include miliary tuberculosis and death. Miliary tuberculosis occurs when TB bacteria gains entry to the blood, spreads throughout the body, and seeds various organ systems. Fatality in disseminated TB is nearly 100% if untreated. Death occurs in hosts who are severely immunocompromised at the time of primary infection, such as malnutritioned or HIV-positive host. The GONE focus is the primary site of M. tuberculosis infection in a lung. It is generally located in the lower portion of the upper middle lobe or the upper portion of the lower lobe. The GONE focus is only visible on chest x-ray if the site has calcified or grows substantially. Another sign of primary infection on chest x-ray is the presence of GONE complexes, which consists of a GONE focus and lobar perihilar lymph node involvement. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the most important of the mycobacteria species that you should know. It is a small, non-motile, aerobic rod with complex cell wall composed of lipids called mycolic acids. The mycolic acid cell wall is responsible for the ability to use acid-fast staining to identify M. tuberculosis. M. tuberculosis will appear red because it resists decolorization by acids during the staining process. There are two other species within the mycobacteria family that you should be familiar with. The key thing that you should know about M. avium intracellulari for the boards are it is seen in AIDS patients with CD4 counts less than 50, we'll talk about this more later, and it primarily causes pulmonary infections leading to disseminated disease. Patients with AIDS should be treated prophylactically against MAI with azithromycin as their CD4 counts begin to drop. M. cancei is very rare. It causes symptoms similar to pulmonary TB. Another mycobacterium species that is sometimes tested on the boards, Mycobacterium leprae, causes the disease known as leprosy or Hansen's disease. Leprosy is a granulomatous disease affecting the peripheral nerves and skin. Left untreated, it can cause permanent damage to nerves, skin, limbs, and eyes. This is an image of a patient with the characteristic leonine or lion face of leprosy. You can see that he has thickened and nodular facial skin and saddle nose deformity where the bridge of the nose collapses. There are two forms of leprosy. Tuberculoid leprosy occurs in patients with strong, intact cell-mediated immunity. These infected people will present with a few hypopigmented macules that have complete sensory loss in and around the lesions. These patients will also have skin granulomas, indicative of a vigorous, intact inflammatory response against the bacterium. Tuberculoid leprosy is usually self-limited, and the infectivity of the skin lesions is quite low, owing to the fact that there are few to none organisms living within the lesions. Lepromatous leprosy, on the other hand, is the more severe form of leprosy that can occur in immunocompromised hosts with weakened T-cell immunity. These patients present with nodular growths and thickening of their skin, which compromises underlying tissue function. Patients will also have stocking and glove peripheral neuropathy.